Like I said, this teaching is going to be on the purpose of having the Holy Spirit. We have churches that believe one thing or another about the Holy Spirit. But we're going to learn what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. And we're not learning so we can go argue with our brother that might belong to another denomination. That's not what we're here for. You know, Pentecostals and Baptists, they probably believe 90% of the Bible. But you get a Baptist and a Pentecostal together, they're going to argue over the 10% that there's disagreement on. Instead of talking about the 90% they do agree on, they're going to fellowship, not a very good fellowship, but argue over what they disagree on. We're learning for ourselves so we know what the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. And for those who might come to you and say, what is the Holy Spirit? What's it for? You can explain to them. You have the scriptures. You can explain it to them. You know, this teaching, I'm the teacher, but once you get it, guess what? Y'all become teachers to someone else. You got all the scriptures there. Go home, study them. Make sure I didn't take the scriptures out of context. But put them here. Put them here. Because once you read them, study it, when you're talking to somebody, the Lord says, I will give you the words to say. You know why he can give you the words to say? Because you have put them here in you. Okay? If you don't ever read them, how is he going to remind you of them? There's a lot of Christians, they, the Lord can't remind them of it because they don't study. But those who study, the Lord can use them. Okay, I'm going to remind them of these verses. And it just comes out. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to start with, how do you get the Holy Spirit? That's what I'm going to start off with. Before I start with the purpose of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to show how do we get the Holy Spirit to begin with. This is, this is us, though. This is, this is what we... Now, all of us, I, I take it, we're all born-again Christians here. But before we became born-again Christians, and for whoever's listened to this teaching, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, this is what the Lord says about us. Okay? In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says, And you hath he quickened. And the word quickened means what? Made alive. He said... He has made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So this one verse right here, just this one verse says, God says, He has made you alive because you were dead. Because we were dead. That's why He says, I am the life. When He said, I am the life, so when you receive Him, now you have life. Amen. But this is what He's saying here is, before you receive the Lord, we are dead. We're as dead. We're as zombies walking in this world. Verse 2. We're in in time past. You walk according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now he says right here. We walk. Before we received Jesus. We walked the way we were taught by the world. Even in churches. There's a lot of traditions in churches. Traditions. Traditions that have nothing to do with the Word of God. But that's what we've learned. The Lord is right here says, you're walking according to the world. Now there are some churches. I'm not saying all churches are just traditional churches. We have churches of God out there. We do have them. It's hard to find, but they are out there. And they're not perfect because the pastor ain't perfect. The people in it ain't perfect. But that's what we have. Okay? So if somebody's out there looking for a perfect church, you might as well give up. It ain't out there. As long as man runs it, it ain't out there. But he says we walk according to the prince and power of the air. And the prince of the, and the power of the air is the devil. I have a teaching on it where because the devil defeated Adam, now the devil is the prince of this world. Because he, first it belonged to Adam. God gave Adam dominion over the world. So he was king of the world. Satan came along and deceived him. And when you defeat a king, that makes you what? A king. So that's why right here it says he's the prince and power of the air, which he is. The spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience. We wrestle against spirit, not against people. Ephesians 6.12 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, wickedness in, in high places. So when you're out there, you're not fighting people. If, I, if I'm out there and this nice, beautiful woman comes on to me, it's not that woman. It's the devil using that woman to get to me. So I'm fighting the devil, not her. Because if she's, if she's not a born-again again Christian and she's coming on to me, well, that's the devil using her. Okay, you see what I'm talking about? So we don't fight against people. We're fighting against the devil who tempts us. That's what we're fighting against. In verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, saying, we've been living the way we've been wanting to live. We, haven't lived, we weren't walking with God. We were feeling our own desires. What made us happy, that's what we was doing. In verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even we, when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. So I'm showing this verse right here. Until you receive the Holy Spirit, we're dead. And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know they are walking zombies, dead. And, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no way you can understand what God wants. You can't understand. People might try to understand them, but they can't. And that's why they give their opinion. And that's why they tell you why I think. Because they don't understand. It says the natural man. That's just a man who doesn't have the Lord. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So he's saying right here, hey, don't, feel the, don't fear the person who can just kill you physically. You don't fear him. God's saying, you better fear me because I can kill you physically and spiritually. And spiritually. And if you're dead spiritually, when you do die physically, where are you going? You know, I read these and I'm like, when people read this, I mean, do they, I mean, if I was to read this verse right here, I would go, whoo. I better give my life to the Lord. You know? I'll, we'll see later on. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto, unto the knowledge of the truth. So what he's saying right here, it is God's will that everybody gets saved. That's God's will. He never meant for any of us to go to hell. When he created Adam and Eve, he created them perfect. That's the way he wanted it. But because of what they did, now we have sin in our life. But now, it's our choice. God gives, there's one thing God has given us. He's given us a free will. We choose what we want to do. He doesn't make us accept them. He says, I'm going to give you your free will. It's going to be up to you where you want to go or who you want to serve. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand. Now, the, one, the, the ones on the left hand is non-believers. Now, you can go back and read and you'll see what that's what it's talking about. But on the left hand, he's talking about the non-believers. He says, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So if, you're, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, he's going to say, depart from me. You are cursed. You are going into the everlasting fire. People joke about hell. 
God said it's an everlasting fire. What does that mean? That fire is never going to go out. You will burn forever and ever. You don't know where eternity is. But that's what eternity is going to be. For the non-believers, they will burn in the fire forever. And it never goes out. And he says, prepared for the devil and his angels, which are the demons. Like I said, God made hell for the devil and the demons. Because they rebelled against him in heaven. So God kicked them out. So he says, I'm going to make hell for them. But then we did the same thing the, the devil did and the demons. We wanted to do our own thing instead of follow God. So he says, well, since you're acting like the devil, then I'm going to send you to the same place. I made it just for them, but since you want to be like them, like the devil and the demons, this is where you'll go also. Matthew 16, verse 25. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give your life for my sake, you will save it. So the Lord's saying right here, he's saying, if you will give up your life, you will save it. But if you want to hold on to your life, then you're going to lose it. I mean, I've given you several scriptures to show it is not good to do your own thing. It's better you give your life to the Lord because heaven is forever. I mean, this time we're in right now on earth, or on earth, this time, I don't care if you live to be 100 or over 100. It's a second. It's just a second compared to eternity. So the Lord has given us this one second that while we're here to make our choice. Do I want to go to heaven forever and ever? Or do I want to go burn in the fire forever and ever? That's the choice people have. They don't read the Bible. I praise God that the Lord put it on me. The Lord put it on me to read his word. And the way I got that way was I was raised Catholic. I got born again. Like I said, I was Catholic. My wife was Baptist. My sister was Jehovah Witness. My boss at work was Pentecostal. So I had all this coming at me. And I was like, I didn't know who to believe. So I started reading the Bible. And that was when I was 25. I'm 58 now. And that's the only book I read. I, I love reading the Bible. I hate reading. I hate, I hate reading in school. That's why I barely, I barely graduated. But when I started reading the Bible, I can't put it down. Amen. And I only read the Bible. I don't read books written by other men. Why? I mean, when you got the Bible right there, the main, I mean, I'm going straight to God. He wrote it, so I'm going straight to him, how he says it. Not what another man thinks he's saying. Like these, this teaching, you see all the scriptures I've given you. I'm giving you the word of God. I'm not giving you my opinion or what I think. The verses I give you, I back them up with verses. So it's going to be kind of, it's going to be kind of hard for someone to say, well, that's your opinion. When I'm giving you nothing but verses. Amen? Amen. John 11.25 Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. It says it over and over. You're dead until you become a believer. Until you receive the Holy Spirit. You know, people say, well, I believe in God. You know what I say to them? Oh, well, guess what? The devil believes in God. In fact, the devil believes in God more than you and me. Because the devil has seen God. We're going by faith that there's a God. The devil has seen God. So he's got, he believes in God more than we do. So for people who say, I believe in God, well, you're not telling me anything. The word believe in the Bible, the word believe means you commit to the Lord. I believe in God. I have committed my life to the Lord. I have trusted my life to the Lord. That's what the word believes in the Bible. That's what it means in the Bible. Not just to believe. That's, it's, it's a different meaning. And, you'll, and you'll, if you read the Bible, study the Bible, you'll see that. That it just doesn't mean believe. John 6, verse 63. The flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh. What is the flesh? A person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. We're in the flesh when we don't have the Holy Spirit. He says, the flesh profiteth nothing. Without the Lord, you have no value in your life. That's what the Lord is saying right here. 
Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. As long as you're doing your own thing, you're not making God happy. That's what it says right here. So then they that are in the flesh, meaning your own thing, cannot please God. You cannot please God when you're not walking with him, when you're in the flesh. Now you have people who are morally good, morally good. Okay, we're talking about morally good, not God's goodness. And the Lord, what does, what does the Lord say about people like that? Romans 7, 18, it says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So until you receive the Holy Spirit, it says right here, there is no good thing in us. No good thing. We have no righteousness. We have no goodness. Morally, what the world sees as being good, but what God sees as being good is different. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Do you hear me? God says all of our right, or whatever goodness we have in God's eyes, God says it's filthy rags. So you can take the little old grandma, little old lady, who will take the shirt off her back, will feed, feed as many people as she can with what little money she has, Unless she has Jesus, unless she has Jesus in her heart to God, that means nothing. Hope you understand what I'm saying here. This, this is the scriptures. The Lord is saying, without me, there is no goodness in you. There is no goodness in you. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which righteousness means goodness. Not by works of your goodness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he has saved us. According to his mercy, his grace, which we don't deserve. None of us deserve God's grace or his love. But when we accept him, then we become his children. Amen. 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 Then he sees us as being righteous, being right with him. Then we're justified. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of, of God. So again, I'm just, I've given all these verses to show you. And as long as you're like this, you do not have the Holy Spirit. You will not have the Holy Spirit until, re, until you receive Jesus in your heart. In your heart. Not in your mind, in your heart. A lot of people have them here in the mind. Very few people have them in the heart. And the Lord said, the Lord said, broad is the gate to destruction, meaning hell. He's, God said, broad is the, the way to hell. Narrow is the way to heaven. And what the Lord is saying here, he said, a lot of people are going to hell. Very few people are going to heaven. And I believe it because there's not very many people living for the Lord. You have a lot of religious people. But not very many people are living for the Lord. Going to church on Sunday, that's not walking with the Lord. That, is not, that doesn't save you. Going to church does not save you. Putting Jesus in your heart is what saves you. That's it. That is it. And until, that, until then, we're in the flesh. And I done gave you several scriptures to show you what does being in the flesh mean. It means you're dead means we're dead. So we need to get the Holy Spirit in us. We need to receive Jesus so we can have life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So right here it says we're made up of three parts. Body, soul, and spirit. That's what we have. The body, that is the flesh. That's, that's the material substance of a human. It's the flesh. The soul, that's your ego, your will, your emotions, your intellect. And many of us have emotional experience, but we 
we haven't really got born again. You have, you have people, like you go to a rock, uh, not a rock concert, but a Christian concert, mainly the youth. And there are Christian, young Christians there. And of course, the, the, the Christian music, the praise music, and for young Christians, it's rock, you know. But they get all excited. And they bring their lost friends, and they get all excited. But that's not accepting the Lord. I mean, at that time, they're excited because everybody else is excited. They're more excited for the music. Yeah. They, they, their emotions are going in them. Yeah. Okay? But the, the emotions, again, that's just the body. We're made up of three parts, and the emotion is one of them. It's like in Matthew's thir chapter 13, it talks about the, uh, the seed falling on the rocky surface. It's, and in that parable, it means that the word is fallen on a person and they got all excited about it. But when the trials and tribulations came, they fell because they had it here. They had it emotionally, but they didn't have it in their heart. That's pretty much what it means. Getting born again doesn't, doesn't come from the mind. Does not come from the mind. For some of us, our intellect prohibits us from obeying the word. Our intellect. Because we don't understand it. And we have a hard time believing it. And because we have a hard time believing our intellect doesn't understand it. We won't believe what we see. What we see. What we can see. That's, I mean, I'm going to be talking about our five senses. But right here, okay, the soul. The soul can fool you. Can fool us. I mean, you, you have the experience, you have the emotions and everything. The intellect, the intellect is, let me say this. One of the hardest people to reach for the Lord is people who are very intelligent. Those are hard, one of the hardest people to reach for the Lord. Because they think they know it all already. Right. And religious people. Religious people the same way. Religious people are hard to reach because they think they're there already. You know, many people, like I said, they've come to the Lord in their mind, but not with their hearts. And because of that, they have a hard time obeying God or walking with Him because they don't have the Holy Spirit to give them the power, which we will learn. The Lord takes a soul that's been proud, and He makes it humble. He takes our soul and makes it humble and obedient. The Spirit... The, tar the Lord takes your dead spirit and makes it alive, which we've already read that. He makes us alive. He makes us meek and obedient to Him. In Genesis, now, when I said spirit, we have a dead spirit, the reason we have a dead spirit is in Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of, this is God talking, speaking to Adam and Eve. He said, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did they eat of the fruit? Yes. Did they die? Spiritually. Physically they didn't die. But spiritually they did die. So now we have a dead spirit. That's how we got our dead spirit. Because yes, they did die. But it was spiritually. So when that's why I'm saying, the Lord says we have a dead spirit. And this is the reason why we have a dead spirit. Because of what Adam and Eve did. But we can fix it. We can correct that if we want to. It's up to us. We have a spirit, but we need God's spirit in us to take over. We need His spirit <coughs> to show us life. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, except the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So if that was a little bit, of, if that was a little hard for you to understand, in the living Bible it says, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. It says, no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. So what do you need? What do we need to understand God? His spirit. His spirit. Amen? Amen? John 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 
If you don't have the Holy Spirit, can you worship God? You don't have the spirit to worship a spirit, right. which is a God. Because it says it right here. God is spirit. And you have to have the spirit of God to, ab to be able to worship him. Now, these are the three parts of us that God wants, which is all of us. We were talking, I told you about the five senses. Everyone has the five senses. And, of course, their smell, their sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. Those are the five senses. Until you accept Jesus, these are the only things we can understand, is these five senses. But the Word of God teaches us there's a sixth sense. There's a sixth sense. Most people don't know it, but there is a sixth sense that you can only get when you get born again. You can only get this sixth sense when you get born again. Well, this sixth sense, it's faith. It's faith from God. That's what the sixth sense is faith. Ephesians 2 8 For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself it is the gift of God. So the faith we don't have faith. We don't have faith until we get the Holy Spirit until we get born again. It plainly says it, it is not of ourselves. We don't have the faith. It's a gift from God. So where does our faith come from? It comes from God. Okay so did we have it when we were in the flesh? No, we didn't have this faith. Not God's faith. Right. I mean, he plays and says it right here. He said, it's not of yourselves. We did not have it. He gave it to us. It's a gift from God. Amen. We better not boast of what great faith I have. Because we don't have it. It came from God. If you have great faith, it's because God gave it to you. Amen. So we ought not brag about our faith in, in whatever. How do we get this faith? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So to get this faith, what do we have to hear? Lord God. And what are we doing tonight? Hear. We're hearing. Lord. We're hearing the word of God. And that's going to strengthen our faith. Amen? Amen. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What do we have to have to please God? Faith. 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 So, again, we don't get this faith until we get born again. So, while we're just in the flesh, there's no way we can please God. How do we receive this faith again? By hearing, right? By right. hearing the word of God. And that's why we as Christians, we need to read the Word. Christians who just listen to the pastor, they are not going to be strong Christians. They are not. And if you go to somebody and they say, well, my pastor said, you're witness to somebody, and you say, well, my pastor says, you're not going to go very far with that. Because he's just a man. But if you can go to him and say, hey, the Bible says, now, now you're carrying power. But a lot of people, they just listen to the pastor and they live on that. But well, where's your trust? In him. In him. The Bible says it's better to put your confidence in, in the Lord than to put your trust in the man. And that's true. Because why? Because God said there's going to be a lot of wolves. There's a, and there are a lot of wolves out there. And they're dressed in cheap's clothing. So they're going to look like preachers, they're going to sound like preachers, but they're wolves. So we need to read the Word of God. That's something I push. Read, study the Word of God. Don't depend on the man. Don't depend on me. And you're not depending on me. If you're taking these scriptures home that I've given you and you're going home and studying them and making sure I didn't take them out of the contents and making sure I'm not a wolf, then you're studying. I mean, when the Bible, one of the gifts is teaching. So the Lord gave teachers. So we need teachers. But like I said, when, you, when they're teaching you, make sure you check them out, whoever it is. Amen? Because men, that's why you have so many people going in ways that we're like, God, how can they believe that? It's because they don't know. They don't read the Word of God. And they, anybody can come to them and say, blah, 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 blah. And, they, and they're like, oh, okay, they think that's the truth. 
Why? Because he looks like a preacher. He acts like a preacher. But they don't know that he's a wolf inside. Well, anyway, uh, Hebrews 11, 6, like it says, you have to uh, believe that God is God. <clears throat> that God is God. It says it right here. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he is God. And he's a rewarder. A rewarder. And what's that reward? We're going to go to heaven. Amen. Amen. So if you're only going by your five senses on believing in God, it's all here. It's in your mind. Not the heart. It comes from, if it comes from the heart, now you're able to get the faith from God. So that's, the, that's what we've been reading. That's what we should understand. Religious people, they live by their five senses. That's the way they live. Religious people. They don't understand the words of God. Once you become a born and Christian, you start to have a war inside of us. Once we give our life to the Lord, we have a war inside of us. And we have to choose. Okay, am I going to believe the word of God? Or am I going to, well, I think this way is better. You're going to believe your way over the way of God. We have a choice. Even though we've become born again Christians, we're, we'll still, through life, have to choose, well, am I going to believe this or, or am I going to believe what I've been taught in my church? The religious part. So we're still going to have a war. We have to choose who we're going to believe and what we're going to believe. And when you choose what the world has taught you, you're going to make a mess. And you can't say the devil made me do it. The devil can't make us do anything. He can tempt us. But he can't make us do anything. Because God has given us a free will. We choose which way we want to go. We choose who, what we want to believe. Do we choose to live by our five senses? Or do we choose to live by faith in the word of God? Is our faith going to be in the word of God and believe what God says? Or we're going to go with our five senses? That's the choice people have to make. And most of the time when we believe our way, it doesn't work. As, like, uh, as, I think I said it earlier. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. You take a wife, for instance. The husband's not being like she wants him to be. Well, instead of praying for him and say, Lord, can you show my husband? Can you whatever with my husband? No. They think they're going to fix it themselves. Seriously. I've seen it. They're going to do it their way instead of God's way. And vice versa. Men. Your wife. You, you show her the right way. You show her the words, but she doesn't want to do it. Don't start fussing at her, fighting with her. Just take it to the Lord. Say, Lord, my wife... She doesn't understand these, or she doesn't receive these verses. You know, leave it to the Lord to correct the other person. Wives, leave it to the Lord to correct the men. Men, leave it to the Lord to correct the women. Amen? Amen. It saves a lot of arguments. <laughs> John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son hath, has everlasting life. He that believeth, and remember what that word believes means. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. You know, you read this to someone who's lost. I don't know. I, I, it would scare me. It would scare me. Yeah, you would think. Because these are some powerful words. I mean, this is just flat out telling you the truth. There's nothing hard about this. These words, are, there's nothing hard about understanding what God is showing us here. Acts 10, 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall, which will, receive remission of sins. Whosoever, that's us. We're the whosoever. Believes in Jesus shall have remission of sins. Amen? Amen? I have sin in my life. That's for, you know, I'm always asking the Lord, oh, <laughs> forgive me, you know. And the thing about it, God 
forgives. If you're asking for forgiveness from here, from your heart, God will forgive. Mm -hmm. And not only does He forgive, what does it say? Forgives. He throws us forward from the east to the west. He forgets about it. That's how far, I mean, God forgets about it. We might bring it up later and say, God, forgive me again for, and God's going to say, what are you talking about? Because <laughs> once you ask Him from the heart to forgive you for whatever, He forgives and forgets. But if you, keep if you keep remembering it, guess who keeps bringing it back to you? The devil. Because the, the devil wants to bring you down. And that's one of the ways he can bring you down, is rem reminding you what you did. God doesn't do that. God forgives and forgets. Do we have a gracious God or what? Amen. Amen. For <laughs> forgives and forgets. I wish I could forget. <laughs> Sometimes I can't forget, but at least I know I'm forgiven. Sometimes I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Now Mark 12:30, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Now this is what being a Christian is. This is a Christian. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart. All of your heart. And with all of your soul. And with all of your mind. And with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. This is a Christian. Someone who gives God all of them. Their heart their soul, and their mind. So to get forgiveness, we have to give the Lord 100% of those three. 100% because He says all. He didn't say 95%. He said all. If He was to say 95%, just guess what we could do with that 5%. I could have a lot of fun with 5%. Not the right kind of fun. But no, He doesn't say that. He says, I want all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. And people who do that, that's your born again Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was, was a preparing within few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Like I said, King James is hard to understand sometimes. The word save here does not mean salvation. Saved by water, that does not mean salvation. And I'll show this to you. Because you have religion out there, they believe you have to be water baptized to make it to heaven. Let me just say this real quick. Anytime you put accept Jesus and, anytime you put an and on it, after accept Jesus and, you have just weakened who Jesus is. Jesus doesn't need anything else. It's except Jesus, period. There's no Jesus and get water baptized. There's no except Jesus and speak in tongues. Accept Jesus and do this, do that. No, no. I'm at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now, verse 21. The light figure, the light figure, whereunto even baptism doeth also now save us, not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot right here. It says that while the Lord was patiently waiting in verse 20 for, the ark, for Noah to build the ark, which took 120 years, he watched this corrupt world. He says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 and 5, he says, And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. That's how I know it took a hundred and twenty years. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagine of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. All those people in, that died in the flood, <coughs> this was them. All they had was evil continually. Now during that 120 years grace period, because it was a grace period because Noah was preaching to them. While they were building the ark for 100 years, Noah was preaching to those people. Because it says in 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on, upon the world of the ungodly. So he was a preacher of right. He was preaching the word of God. Noah preached salvation to those people. He, did, he preached deliverance 
from the wrath of God to come. He was, he was preaching, hey, there's a, you can be delivered from this. You know, the Lord always warns. He always warns. If it's a, he warns a person, or he'll warn a city, or he'll warn a nation, and he, he'll even warn the world before he'll bring his wrath on it. We see that all through the Bible. He, this is one of them. Solomon and Gomorrah, that's another one, and there's others. But the Lord always warned. He always warned before he did it. John 1, 9. Now when he warns, we, since he warns us, and he warns us, we can't stand before the Lord on judgment say, and say, God, I didn't know. We can't say that. Because in John chapter 1, verse 9, he says, That was the true light, speaking about Jesus here. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So anybody who was born in this world, God says right here that Jesus has enlightened them. Enlightened them about what? Who he is. So no one, no one will be able to go on the day of judgment and say, I didn't know. Because God's going to say, hey, I enlightened everybody. Right now, if there was a lost person in here right now. God would tell that person, hey, do you remember on uh, February, whatever day this is, uh, I used my child, Jesse, to speak to you about salvation. And you rejected it. That's what God's going to do. On the day of judgment, you, there's not going to be nothing you'll be able to say. Right. But the people of Noah, did they listen? No. And why didn't they listen? Why didn't they listen and receive? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 and 6. In whom the God of this world, and who's the God of this world? The prince of this world? Yeah. The devil. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying right here? Yes. Yes. Satan has blinded them. But the Lord's light, Jesus, the light, has broken through that, through that darkness to show people who he is. There's nothing, there's nothing God can't break through. There's no dark. I don't care how thick the darkness is, God can break through it. Okay, so even though the devil blinded, blinded their eyes, God's light, Jesus, broke through it. Now, Peter made it clear that, because of what I read up above about baptism, Peter made it clear that he did not want the people to think that water baptism, baptism is what saved them. Because it says, baptism doeth also now save us. If you read that, it's what it sounds like, right? But right after he says that, right after he says that, he says, it doesn't remove the filth of the flesh. You can't be born again Christian without repenting. Repenting of what? The filth of the flesh. So there's no way water baptism, water baptism can save them. Because right here, like I said, right after he says that, the very next statement, it doesn't remove the filth of the flesh. First Corinthians, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. A new creature. Is he still in the filth of the flesh? No, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. What is the old things? The filth of the flesh. Behold, all things become new. He says it right after he makes that statement. He says, but it's not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh. So we have, we've read every word. And it says in verse 21, remember, it says in verse 21, it's a like figure. Okay, that's very important. We need to see that. You have the water. In Noah's days, you had the water. You had the, the people under the water. That was the world. The people above the water. And that was the believers. And the water separated the world, the laws from the believers, right? What saved Noah and his family? Water saved them physically. Get me now. Water saved Noah and his family physically. But you know what saved them spiritually? It's right there in the last part of verse 21. 
What saved them was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what saved them. The water separated the non-believers from the believers. And it saved, yes, saved, but it saved them physically. It didn't save them spiritually, the water. So water baptism does not save you. It's a like figure what he's talking about. The water saved Noah, but it wasn't a spiritual saving. I hope you all understand what I'm saying here. If Jesus Christ didn't resurrect, could we be saved? No. So that's what saved them. Because Jesus resurrected, defeated the grave, defeated death. Now we have salvation. And that's what saved Noah. Even though it happened over here, yeah. but what you think everybody in the Old Testament went to hell? No. no. When you believe in God in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is all about Jesus, which I'm going to get on that. The, the Old Testament, which people... Oh, we don't, the Old Testament, that was just, no. The New Testament, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead, but the New Testament, there's a verse in the New Testament where Jesus says, the Old Testament is all about me. That's what Jesus said. Now, how, come, how people can say, well, the Old Testament, that's, no. If you read the Old Testament, it's pretty obvious. It's <laughs> well, there's some places you, you got to, like Noah, I mean not Noah, uh, Jonah. He was a type of Jesus. He went into the belly's well for how long? Three days and three nights. I mean, I'd have to, we did a teaching on Jonah. Yeah. And if you already forgot, I'm going to have to do it again, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, there's, and I'm going to, later on in this teaching right here, I'm going to show you uh, a type of Christ that's in the New, that's in the Old Testament. So when you read in the Old Testament, which you really have to understand, you have to read the whole Bible so you can connect things together. Yeah. Okay? But I'm gonna, uh, later on in this teaching, I'm going to show you that. I write that tonight. The two things I'm teaching is how we are before we get the Holy Spirit, and then water. What is water? Does it save us, or is it just a sign? Yeah. Like, a, like water baptism, when we get baptized in church, what are you doing? Dunking you in the water, showing that you're drowning in your sins. You come up out of the water, showing you're a new creature. It's just a symbol, just a, you know, uh, what's a word for that? Like a physical way to express it. another yeah. picture. Yeah, it's just, yeah, right. another picture. Uh, so, what this color? picture here is, 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 if you look at it wrong, you will think that you need to be water baptized. Right. But the scriptures will show what it means.